Bruchem mm Aboim. -hmm. Thank you very much for attending. Welcome to our home. Um, the first part of our lecture tonight on my thoughts was the uh, name of the lecture will be Three Questions and Prayers. Uh, on this week's My Thoughts, I would like to examine three prayers that we recite. Uh, the first prayer we re is recited every Shabbat and Chag, Jewish holiday, whereas the other two prayers are unique to the High Holidays. I believe that the message that these three prayers convey is both timeless and universal. Now, the first prayer that I would like to examine is the opening prayer in the Shabbat and Yom Tov Shacharit, morning prayer. It begins with the Hebrew words, Shochenad Moron, which translates to mean, He who dwells for eternity. In many of the holiday prayer books, the last 12 words of this prayer are divided into four lines, uh, with three words on each line. I think this fact is not an accident. These 12 words correspond with the 12 stones that were worn on the breastplate of the high priest in the temple. This was the first spiritual wireless internet connection. These stones were also set into rows with four stones placed vertically and three stones placed horizontally. If you were to look closely, you would notice that the first letter in the four words that begin the second column vertically spell out the name Yitzchak. Then again, if you would look at the third letter of, of the four words in the third column, vertically, would spell out the name Rivka. Now, once again, since we know that nothing is an accident, what is this allusion to both Yitzchak and Rivka telling us? The Torah tells us that three out of four of the mothers of Israel were barren. On the other hand, the only one of the forefathers who was sterile was Yitzchak. As we learn from the verse in the portion of Toldot, there it states, Ki atorah he, because she was sterile. The Hebrew word for she uh, is pronounced he. In this case, the word is read as it is feminine, but in reality it is spelled with, as if it were masculine who, again with a vav instead of a yud, which was an allusion to the fact that both Yitzchak and Rivka were both incapable of conceiving and bearing children, which made the fact that Rivka gave birth to twins an even greater miracle. Now the other three barren women of Israel also gave birth miraculously, but it was only they and not their husbands that were barren. Uh, continuing, I believe that this is the reason that this righteous couple was chosen to represent all of us in the opening prayer on the holiest day of the year. From the way that they prayed, we also learn an important lesson about prayer itself. It says that she stood in one corner of the room and that he stood in the other. And that was the way, and then they both prayed to God. Now Rashi tells us that he was answered first, since he was, the tz, he was a tzaddik, uh, the son of a tzaddik. But there are other commentaries who say that actually she was answered first, since she was a balat chuba, uh, a, a, a repentant individual. And our sages tell us that a balat chuba is even greater than a tzaddik. So she prayed that her husband, the tzaddik, who was the son of a tzaddik, should be answered first. And he prayed that she, the Bale Tshuva, that she should be answered first, and his prayer was accepted. But a question does come to mind. Why were three of the mothers of Israel, Sarah, Rivka, and Rachel, all barren? Rashi does give us an answer. He says that God loves to hear the prayers of the righteous. Now, that makes sense, but we're referring to three of the most righteous women in history. What did they do all day but pray to God? So from Rashi's answer, I think that we learn a, a great lesson in life. No matter how well one thinks that they pray, when you really need God's assistance, hmm, somehow we all pray just a little better, even righteous individuals. So too on these Shabbosim and Yom Tovu, when we turn our prayers to God, our Father in Heaven, we need to believe that anything Anything is possible if you believe. As we see that two sterile individuals were blessed and then she was able to give birth to twins. We also learn from these two illustrious individuals that the most effective prayer that we can present before God Almighty is to pray for someone else, especially if that other individual has the same need for a blessing that we need. 
The Talmud in the Tractate of Shabbat states that God wanted to destroy the nation of Israel for their sins, and that both Abram Avinu and Yaakov, our fathers, tell God that if the nation had sinned so grievously against you, then you should destroy them. But, you know, when God approaches Yitzhak with the same statement, he stands toe-to-toe -to -toe with God. He tells God, my children and not yours. In the end, Yitzhak says to God Almighty, you know, that I too had a wayward son. I loved him. You should do the same. Yitzhak is the true father of the nation of Israel. And Rivka, the first Jewish mother willing to put herself in harm's way in order to protect her dearest child. Uh, it was she who insisted that Yaakov dress up like his older brother Esau and trick his father into giving him Esau's blessing. Yaakov said to his mother that if his father would recognize his charade, huh, he would most likely curse him rather than bless him. To which his mother replied, A lie, Bani, on me, my son. Meaning that if Yitzchak would curse Yaakov, then that curse should rest on her and not on him. A Yiddish mama, a true Jewish mother. So we can see why these two illustrious individuals were chosen to represent all of the Jewish nation at these holiest times of the year. Something that even the Muslims understand, the power of Yitzchak. You know, we see an allusion to this power written in the Torah. There it states in the portion of Toldot that Avimelech, the king of the Pelishtim, and his top general came to visit Yitzchak. They wanted to propose a peace treaty with him. Now, now the request was, if you think about it, very unusual, since Yitzchak never fought any battles, nor was he involved in any conflicts. That is in contrast to both his grandfather, Abmeravinu, who fought with the four kings, and also Yaakovinu, his son, who testified to his son, Yosef, on his deathbed in the portion of Ayachi, that he had to take Shechem, Becharbi Uvakashti, with my sword and with my bow. Yet they both came to Yitzchak hoping that he would accept a peace treaty with them. The awesome power and respect that Yitzchak possessed, the attribute of Vura, strength. You know that if you visit the Machpelah today, the building in Hebron that houses the burial plots of our forefathers and their wives, uh, there's a Rashi that states that the remains of Adam and Chava are also buried in the cave. You know, I find it interesting that you can visit the burial plots of Avram Vino and Yaakov Vino, our fathers, 365 days of the year. They are in the Jewish part of the Machpelah. But the burial plot of Yitzchak Avino rests in the Muslim part of the Machpelah. And Jews are only allowed entrance 10 times a year during the 10 days of repentance Somehow, even though Yitzhak had nothing to do with the Muslim religion, still they understand the power that he still possesses. So should we. When looking at the gematria of the name Yitzhak, it is 208. And the gematria of the name Rivka is 307. Together they equal 515. This is a, this gematria is very propitious since it is the same gematria as the Hebrew word tefillah, prayer. As we read in the opening words of the portion of Etchanan, Moshe tells the people of Israel that for Etchanan el Hashem, and I prayed to God. We see that before Moshe dies, he presents God with 515 prayers, the gematria of the Hebrew word for Etchanan. He did so because we have a belief based on the teachings of Kabbalah, that all the angels combined prayed 550 prayers to God daily. Moshe was hoping that God would accept his prayer and allow him to enter into the land of Israel. So on these special days of prayer, we too want to connect to Yitzhak, our father, Rivka, our mother, Moshe, our teacher, and the angels that are above us, so that our prayers will be able to reach up to our Father in heaven. Next, the second prayer that I would like to examine is a very unusual prayer that we recite only on the high holidays. In addition, we can find a connection with this prayer and one of the four sons that we read in our Pesach Haggadah. In the Musa prayer that we recite on the high holidays, we say the words, Teshuvah, Tefillah, and Utztaka, Ma'avirin et Roa Hagazera, that repentance, prayer, and charity 
annul the evil decree. In many of the high holiday prayers, you will see in the smaller print above these three words, the Hebrew words som, kol, and mamon, which are fasting, voice, which is an allusion to crying out, and money. Now, each of these three words has a numerical value of 136. This gematria is very important since by moving the numbers 1, 3, and 6 around, actually they become the number 613. 613 is the number of commandments found in the Torah. In addition, God created the world with 10 traits that he took upon himself. Three are intellectual and seven are emotional. In the emotional traits, six are masculine and one is feminine. <coughs> so what we have is one, three, and six. Again, the number 10. Now, three times 136 is 408. This is important to remember because this gematria, this numerical value, connects to the third son that we read about in the Pesach HaGodah, the Tam, the simple son. His question is really relatively simple. He asks, Mazot, what is this all about? And we answer him, that with a strong hand, God took us out of Egypt to the house of bondage. So far, so good. But we also read that Torah refers to Yaakov, our father, as an ish tam, Yoshe Beholem, as a perfect man dwelling in the tents of Torah. That being the case, then the question of the tam, whom we can identify with Yaakov, must have a much deeper meaning. So what then is his question? His question is universal. He wants to know, Mazos, how can I believe, how can I be certain that repentance, prayer, and charity annul the evil decree? So we answer him by first looking at the three words in small print written above these three words, each with the gematria, numerical value of 136. Well, together the three words equal 408, and the, that which is the gematria of the word zos. The Hebrew letters of the word zos are also an acronym for zacher al tishkach. Remember, do not forget. The Jewish nation that was incarcerated in Egypt experienced all three of the conditions that are mentioned in this prayer. Son, fasting. After all, they spent 86 years in the oppressive slavery. Cold, crying out. The Torah tells us that God heard kolenu, our voices, our cries, and mumon, money. In this situation, it was not to give charity, but rather to follow God's request to Moshe, that the people should accept the gold and silver from their Egyptian neighbors. So we see the children of Israel experience all three of these scenarios in Egypt, which alludes to tshuva, tefillah, and tzedakah, repentance, prayer, and charity, and then the chosek yod, with a strong hand, God took them out of the servitude of Egypt. Yaakov the Tom, his question is now answered. We now have verifiable proof that this three braided rope does have the ability to bring about complete forgiveness, not just on the high holidays. This formula works for us each and every day of the year. Now the third prayer that I would like to examine what is referred to as the Asara Haruge Malchut, the account of the ten martyrs. You know, there's a story told about an Israeli politician from the left-wing Mai Pai Party who was visiting New York City. He was not a religious person, but he, like many other Israeli politicians who visited New York City, was staying in the home of Rabbi Yaman Klein in Crown Heights. It just so happened that his visit coincided with the high holidays which in reality meant very little to him. But, but being a man of intellectual curiosity, he decided to attend services on Yom Kippur. He put on a talit and he began to read. Read, not pray in the Magzer, the Holy Prayer Book. He came to the story of the ten martyrs and he read the words that the angel said to God as they watched these ten illustrious individuals being tortured by the Romans. The prayer book states that the angels asked God, Zu Torah, Zu Shara, this is Torah and this is its reward? God answers them that if I hear another word from you, I will turn the world back to water, back to Tohu Vavohu, emptiness and void. Well, <laughs> when he read these words spoken by the angel and then God's reply, 
this politician was incensed. He turned to Rabbi Klein and demanded an answer. He said, is God so thin, so thin-skinned that if the angels ask him a question, he will destroy the world? Rabbi Klein said that he had a legitimate question, but that he really didn't have the answer. Rabbi Klein said they should go to ask an elderly scholar who was in the synagogue. So they went to the elderly scholar and the politician presented his question. The elderly scholar nodded and acknowledged that it was a pertinent question. He said to the politician, let me answer your question with a parable. You know, there was once a king who employed a Jewish tailor to fashion all of his royal garments. The king was quite happy with all the clothing that the tailor fashioned. The tailor had gifted hands and everything that he made was worthy of a king. In addition to being an expert tailor, the Jew was also a Talmud Chacham. He was a Torah scholar. The king enjoyed speaking to a Jewish tailor and, and they would converse on many very topics for hours. The king would even ask his advice on matters of state. Now it happened that the archbishop was a rabbi anti-Semite and he tried to think of all ways to end the close relationship that existed between the Jewish tailor and the king. Finally, he came upon a scheme that he was certain would put an end to the Jew once and for all. He came back from a trip from Rome and presented the king with a bolt of the finest silk. He told the king that this cloth had been presented to him by the Pope himself. He told the king that it was the holiest of materials. He warned the king that if someone were to use even one thread of the material for their own personal use, that person would have to be put to death. The king took the cloth and presented it to his Jewish tailor and asked him to fashion a garment with the material that would befit his station as the king of the land. However, the king never mentioned that if any of the material were missing, that it would cost the Jewish tailor his life. He really saw no reason to make the tailor worry for nothing. After all, the king knew that the tailor was an honest man. The elderly scholar continued with the story and the politician was listening attentively. He said two weeks later, the tailor presented the king with a magnificent garment. Well, the king was more than pleased with the design and workmanship. Not even one seam was visible. That night, the king was visited by the archbishop and with him he brought nine other priests. He told the king that he was sorry to inform the king, but that he had no choice but to execute his Jewish tailor. He, they said that they had proof that he had taken some of the holy threads from the cloth and used it for his own personal use. Well, the next day the king ordered that the Jewish tailor be brought to him. He explained to the tailor that though it pained him deeply, he had no choice but to order his execution, since he had taken some of the sacred cloth that made up the holy garment that he had fashioned. Hearing all the king said, the tailor asked the king for one last favor before he was about to be executed. He asked the king for a pair of scissors. The king looked at him warily. He said, do not damage the cloth. The tailor assured the king that he had no intention of damaging the garment. One by one, he began to take all of the stitches out of the garment. When he was finished, he laid out all the material in front of the king. It was evident for all to see that every thread of the cloth was used for the garment. The archbishop paid heavily for his nefarious advice. The elderly scholar then turned to the Israeli politician and said, that was exactly what God was saying to the angels. They asked him a question and he said to them that in order for them to understand the answer as to why the ten martyrs were killed, he, God Almighty, would have had to revert the whole world back to the beginning of creation. Then and only then would they be able to understand that somehow, and that in some way, Olam Chesed Yibane, that this whole world was created for kindness. So in the end, whether we understand it or not, the death of these 10 illustrious individuals and all other horrific tragedies that have befallen our people throughout history, in the end, we should merit to see that they were all part of a greater master plan of goodness orchestrated by a loving and benevolent Father. Yes, we constantly ask the question, 
how can God do this or how could he do that? We are constantly questioning, judging God. Somehow we think that if we were God, hmm, we could do a better job. The Rambam said it very well when he stated, if I could understand God, then I would be God. So we've dealt with the three basic questions in prayer and in our lives. I hope that with a deeper understanding of these three prayers, it will help us all to accept, though we may not totally comprehend, that there is a loving Father in heaven who loves us dearly, even though we may not always understand or appreciate all of his actions. And with that, let us hope to usher in the coming of Siat Tekeno quickly and in our time. Again, I want to thank you very much for attending. Again, we wish you all and bless you all with the safe, safety and happiness, health, success. And again, God should bless you with all that is good. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you for attending.